Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get started because uh, I've got a lot, to a lot to talk about, so I'm gonna uh, try to keep to time. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Rohini Joshi. I'm a member of the operations team at the SKA Observatory. We're looking to build some fantastic radio telescopes at the SKA Observatory and talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but I'm here to share a bit about our Kubernetes and cloud native journey at the SKAO. Um, a lot of the work that I'm presenting here today is on behalf of a much wider group of people, uh, some of whom are listed here, and uh, Uger is here with me today as well. So I'll start with a bit about myself. Um, I'm very passionate about trying to make this group of technologies, um, encouraging more adoption of it within my area of work within the observatory specifically, and introducing this to, to new communities, especially those in the research and academic settings. Uh, my background is being an engineer and a developer. Um, I do more product things now. I'm a product owner and product management um, and architecture development support uh, and also a bit of uh, Kubernetes. I'm also really re interested recently in domain-driven design. So if that's something that you're interested in as well, I'd love to talk to you. Um, and this picture here at the bottom is one of the Lovell Telescope where the SK headquarters are located. And sometimes we get really beautiful days like this in England. So I'll start by telling you a bit about the SK Observatory, who we are, what we're going to do, what we're going to build, um, and why it's important. Uh, this is a picture of what our telescopes might look like and how leaning into a cloud-native architecture and, and strategy will help us tackle some of the challenges in our ecosystem. And then lastly, a bit of a technical, not-so-deep dive into how we migrated our clusters uh, from a more clunky manual deployment strategy to um, a more sophisticated deployment strategy with Cluster API. And I'll finish with a bit of um, sort of process thoughts and uh, insights about what I think worked really well for us in, in approaching that, that piece of work. Um, so you might be somebody who's interested in the SK project in general or wanting to hear about how we looked to adopt some cloud native tooling um, or a bit of both. There is a bit of technical knowledge assumed in the presentation, but um, as I said, I'll mention some process insights as well, so hopefully something in here for, for everyone. And uh, so to start with, we're going to forget about Kubernetes and Cloud Native for a second, and I'm just going to tell you about the SK Observatory, uh, starting with a short video clip that just delivers our mission statement and tells you a bit about who we are and what we're going to build. Doing that again. Um, so this is the SKO's mission. Uh, the telescopes that we're building are located in remote regions of uh, Western Australia and South, uh, South Africa. And we recognize and acknowledge the indigenous people and cultures who have traditionally lived on the lands on which our facilities are located. So we're a fairly large science project in terms of construction costs, engineering infrastructure that's going to be deployed on the ground, as well as science data that's going to be generated and put in the hands of our science user community um, over the next several decades, leading to some pretty transformational science. And the science is really why we're doing this. Um, this is the wide range of SKO science drivers, uh, the versatility of the instrument and the wide range of radio frequencies that we're going to observe over and the high um, the observing modes that are available with the telescope itself is what's enabling all of these different science drivers. And it's because we're observing in the radio spectrum that allows us to really probe the universe in, in really unique ways. Um, and the stars really do look different in radio. 
So we're hoping to answer a lot of fundamental questions about the universe, uh, including hopefully whether the answer to life, the universe and everything is 42. Um, so we're an intergovernmental organization with growing global membership. Um, we're up to nine countries now, nine member countries now, I believe. Construction has started, and so it's a really exciting time for the project. We're working with distributed teams as they build the physical infrastructure, the software infrastructure, and we establish ways of working across the same. Uh, I'll spend a little bit of time just talking about the telescopes themselves as they serve the starting point of our whole data journey. So SK Mid in South Africa consists of nearly 200 um, dishes uh, deployed across, across South Africa with a maximum separation of 150 kilometers between them to give you an idea of scale. And SK Low consists of uh, many, many log periodic antennas in Australia grouped into stations and separated by a maximum of 74 kilometers. And the nomenclature difference between these two uh, signifies the frequency range difference that they're operating under and that SKLO operates at a lower frequency range than mid. And as I said, these are really the starting point of, of our data journey. So they're capturing elect electromagnetic waves from the universe, turning them into voltages, and um, helping us um, turn that into science data products uh, down the line. So this data flow is what we're looking at next here. This data flow diagram is going to make a few appearances uh, in this talk. So what we're seeing essentially from left to right is raw digitized packets that are being reduced in volume um, over several processing stages before they're turned into observatory data products that are delivered to the SK regional centers in the hands of our users across two high bandwidth network links. So the signal processing that's happening um, in these stages yeah, that, that's happening in these stages really depends on the specific science use case, but um, due to the high data rates involved, up to the central signal processor, which is around, uh, around this point here, we're looking at largely near real-time workflows, and then the science data processor onwards, uh, mostly consisting of, of batch workflows and pseudo real-time workflows. Um, the data rates still being as high as they are, and the science data processor having limited storage capacity means that uh, we have this next stage of, of which is the data transport and dissemination to the network of regional centers, which is where the users are gonna have access to their data. And even though data is being reduced through all of this, we're still looking at about a petabyte of data a day that the SK regional centers will be ingesting from each telescope. Now, all of those numbers were for full-scale operations, so we're not gonna build all of that in one go. That would be terrifying. Um, but uh, we have a staged rollout plan in the form of what we call array assemblies, or AAs, starting with A0.5, which is coming up very soon, uh, and building up to A star and hopefully eventually A4. So the plan is to build and deploy, test and verify a fully working system at each of those array assemblies. And what this graph at the bottom here is really trying to highlight is that as we deploy more stations and dishes with each um, subsequent array assembly, the data rates that are going into the science data processor are increasing exponentially. And that's due to the nature of uh, radio interferometry. So being a software-driven telescope, we really need to build the software such that it can scale and keep up as we, as we build up this instrument. And here in the middle, I've, I've tried to show um, what a simulated version of the M83 galaxy it might look like as observed with a four-hour observation for SK mid for A2. Um, and if you keep your eyes on there for a second, uh, that's what it might look like with A4. So a lot more beautiful data and a lot more uh, wonderful science that's possible with it. But of course, you can see how the data rates have, have gone up uh, so high that you can't even see A2 <laughs> in, that, in that graph uh, by the end. So Jumping back to the data flow diagram, just to highlight that last stage of the data journey, as is shown here, which is moving the data across two high bandwidth network links from Perth and Cape Town to a network of SK regional centers, or SRCs. Um, this is where the users are going to have access uh, to the data. Users don't have access to the data as it's being reduced within the observatory itself. So the SK regional centers are um, essentially serving the part of the data life cycle where the, where the science is gonna happen. And we're gonna put this data in the hands of our science users and they can see it, they can process it, they can um, visualize it, things like that. So what we need to build here is a set of software applications that serve uh, these core capabilities and such that we're able to efficiently utilize distributed heterogeneous infrastructure around the world that's managed by different institutions, often academic institutions, working with on-prem resources and building and deploying these with a distributed and diverse set of uh, humans as well. So that um, there's quite a few challenges in this problem space and um, I'll touch a bit more upon how a cloud-native landscape, uh, how the cloud-native landscape can help us deal with those challenges in a bit. 
Um, the last thing to say here is that SK regional centers are kind of my main primary area of focus at the observatory, along with a wonderful team. And Uger, who is here with me today, focuses on the more core observatory side of things. So I'm presenting a lot of broad context here today, but the regional centers are uh, kind of my main area of focus. So with that background in mind, and with, this, with the context of this ecosystem that we're working with, um, how can a cloud native architecture um, yeah, what is it that we need help with? How can a cognitive architecture help us build and deliver this software-driven telescope? Um, and to talk about that, I'll first talk about what is it that we need help with. Um, we're a highly distributed and diverse project. This isn't just true of the SK Regional Centers, it's true of the project as a whole. There's um, upwards of nearly, I think, 30 teams that are working on the SK's uh, SK Observatory software. and. There's a set of small central teams in the observatory who are driving uh, these, these efforts, but a majority of the teams are located outside the observatory. And so there's distributed teams, mean different time zones, different cultures, different developer experiences, um, but also different delivery timeframes that they're working with, depending on their component of focus and a large and varied code base as well. So the regional centers also come with some additional unique challenges because there's a distributed governance structure and distributed physical infrastructure as well. So we're looking at how can a cloud native architecture help us deliver the, a system, a high quality system, given, given, this, um, given this background. So here's what the cloud native architecture adoption looks like for the observatory for the upcoming array assembly release. And this is quite a busy slide, but um, it highlights some of the tools that we're using at the minute. And the idea here has been that by standardizing on containerization as a first class citizen, it's allowing us to um, lean into the cloud native ecosystem, leverage a lot of the ecosystem, and enabling a set of practices. And this golden layer here that's shown at the orchestration layer is our software contract uh, with the platform underneath. So this means that as long as we're respecting that, um, we're able to mix and match infrastructure components underneath if we need to, uh, making our software portable, and uh, shielding our developers and architects from hardware complexities for the most part. <laughs> And what this might mean in reality, I've tried to use that Adafloat diagram again to highlight where we might see Kubernetes popping up. And what this may mean in reality is single node clusters to help us operate the dishes and stations um, out in the remote regions of South Africa and Australia, a control system cluster to help us orchestrate the activities between the elements and the downstream data processing, a science data processor that uh, interfaces with this cluster largely operates as an HPC facility supporting multiple execution engines that's producing the observatory's data products and hopefully um, heterogeneous clusters that host the SK Regional Center services as well. But that's still an area that's a work in progress. So as you can imagine, there's a large degree of highly bespoke instrumentation for the telescope, especially in the control system side of things. We're not working with a general purpose standard software platform here. And we're essentially looking to operate a science data production line that's operating as close to 24 seven as possible. And this is a bit different to how current facilities operate. So um, being a software driven telescope, predictability and reliability are gonna be really, really important to us because we can't afford to waste telescope time. And we're hoping that by leaning into this cloud native landscape that we, uh, we can have some help with that. So we're already seeing how a cloud native architecture can help us um, with some of these challenges, uh, providing us with standardization that's helping us bridge gaps, whether that's gaps due to time zones, um, communication, um, uh, and with uh, consistent tooling and documentation and CICD templates, things like that, and also giving us portability and abstraction with, like I said, a, a target API um, that allows us to build against a software contract that remains consistent no matter the underlying infrastructure. So that's something which uh, leads to smoother developer experiences as well. And working with a community here that is very distributed and diverse as well, I think will help us kind of deal with some of our social and collaboration challenges as well. Uh, the second point here I mentioned with the SK Regional Center space in mind, uh, we're, we're still, we still have some work to do with respect to a cloud native architecture specifically for the SK Regional Centers, but um, given the fact that it's a lot of heterogeneous resources in different jurisdictions across different um, uh, physical locations, interoperability is something that's going to be really key in the SK Regional Center network. So 
if we can use cloud native tools to help us bridge those gaps and help us speak the same language, that's gonna be really important for the sustainability of the project. And I think it's gonna help us attract and retain talented people to come work for us as well. So yeah, please come work for us. Um, so this, I'm, I'm really excited to hopefully see a bit more of an active research community here to engage with um, at, um, so I think, it's something that will help both the research community and the cloud native community as we expose existing technologies to new applications and exercise them in order to further improve them. So um, really looking forward to, to more of that. So now we'll move on to talking about the adoption of one specific uh, cloud native tool, which was Cluster API, and uh, moving to that and how that helped us uh, clean, up our, um, uh, clean up our act a bit. <laughs> Um, starting with the infrastructure that we were targeting as part of this exercise, uh, we had private cloud resources that we had access to thanks to the UKRI and IRIS project. And there were two OpenStack projects that I'm going to talk about here specifically. The TechOps project, which houses some of the services mentioned here, uh, managed by the system team, uh, who Uger is here representing. And um, this was roughly a 1500 CPU uh, project with some GPUs as well and some, uh, some uh, storage and memory uh, as well. And the SK Regional Center project, which was a smaller project of about like 500 to 700 CPU, and it houses some of the prototype deployments of the kinds of tools and services we'll need for the SK Regional Center network. So examples here being Jupyter Hub or Ceph or um, some astronomy domain specific tools as well, like visualization tools that are user facing. So what existed in these projects before is um, OpenStack VMs that were turned into Kubernetes clusters using Kubadium. Uh, this was very manual, this was very difficult to maintain, and this often meant that it just wasn't maintained. And infrequent upgrades leave the door open for security vulnerabilities, but also we didn't really have a lot of portability or any protection against hardware failures. In the SK Regional Center project, we had a tendency to have uh, single purpose clusters that we brought up to house a specific service that we were prototyping at that time. Um, of course, single a cluster per service can be a perfectly valid design choice uh, that's made. However, this wasn't so in our, it wasn't a conscious decision in our case, it sort of just organically happened and it was adding to our maintenance burden. And clunky stuff like this just makes it difficult for anybody to want to touch it, but least of all new people. So this, this kind of conversation was very common in the office, which was, uh, where's that YAML? I can't find it. It's on this VM somewhere. I don't remember where it is. Uh, so now we fish around for our YAMLs on GitLab instead. Um, and having moved to the cluster API based deployment strategy, the TechOps project mainly consists of a staging and production uh, clusters that serve the development teams housing the same services that I mentioned earlier. And uh, on demand clusters are also now possible as a result of this transition, um, but not yet used in earnest. Uh, the production cluster is about a thousand CPU ish cluster with um, large nodes, and the staging cluster replicates the services, but not the, not the size. And the SK Regional Center project, we consolidated some of our applications, most of our applications, into a single high purpose, uh, high availability, multi purpose cluster with services separated by namespaces this time. And we reused a lot of the internal tooling that was built largely by the system team uh, to help us make this transition in both projects. And we'll talk about that tooling next. So it started with uh, Ansible roles, and these Ansible roles were defined uh, in a very modular way for all stages of cluster rollout, bootstrapping, service deployment, application deployment, and they came with sort of matching Ansible playbooks. And both the roles and playbooks were parameterized such that we could manage variables, uh, we could do variable management via the make files uh, that, that they came with as well. And as I said, we made the transition in both projects at the same time, and that was really, that was really valuable. So to clarify this a little bit further, this is just uh, describing that in a bit more detail. You can see at the very top the, um, an example of a create workload cluster uh, make target that points to the create workload uh, playbook. And that playbook in turn points to the create workload role in the SK collections. And that role contains the tasks and defaults required to do that specific outcome. So this was the kind of machinery that was built and will go next to talking about how the system team put this into action to make the move in the tech ops project. So it started by laying a lot of groundwork well in advance. This included uh, upscaling within the team, reading about cluster API, um, documenting, reading about it and documenting it internally on our confluence as well, and setting up test clusters to play with, uh, followed by setting up the staging and production clusters that we need uh, ahead of the migration itself. So the migration from a week away uh, involved redeploying the workloads on the new cluster API cluster, 
doing heaps of testing, both automatic testing and manual testing, and testing the scaling uh, functionalities as well. From a day away, there was re-informing people uh, via Slack of uh, the migration that's about to happen and some implications of that, that that might occur and hiccups that might occur. And we have um, persistent kubeconfig access for our developers, a uh, generation of which is scripted. And then finally, uh, we have reverse proxy in front of this infrastructure. So ingress routing was, was swapped over to point to the new stuff. And then there was a test wait and watch uh, period. And thankfully, uh, we didn't have any issues and there was minimal downtime. Now, things were a little bit different in the SK Regional Center project simply because our use case uh, for Cluster API was a bit different and it was a bit simpler. So while there was an extensive amount of wonderful tooling that was built by the system team for this, it was geared towards their more complex use case. And that's something that we simply didn't, we didn't want to inherit complexity that we didn't require and that we at times didn't fully understand. So, However, those Ansible roles that were built were really doing the meat of the work and they were modularly defined enough that we could sort of pick and mix the ones that we did need and leave out the ones that weren't applicable to us so much. So there's an example of some roles that we, um, that we did use and some that we didn't. So we built Ansible playbooks and, and, and our own make files around it that were a bit simpler and easier for us to understand because A, we built them ourselves and, and B, they were just a bit simpler um, overall. So, even though Ansible knowledge within the team was um, fairly decent at the start of this, this approach allowed us to kind of um, improve that within the team as well. And it just made cluster API adoption overall a lot more doable and less overwhelming for, for everybody um, in the team. And I'll touch a bit more upon this while this was important uh, towards the end. So life is better now. Uh, maintenance uh, is easier. Um, managing nodes is easier. Um, scaling is easier. Uh, we were able to do uh, on-demand clusters as well now, as I mentioned, uh, pre-post code pre-post hooks work really well for us, including uh, those for Argo CD. Um, however, of course, there is still a reliance on a management cluster. And in our case, this is an Ansible orchestrated Minikube cluster. And of course, due to the caveats around using Minikube in a production environment, we use Valero backups to try to stay on top of this. Uh, second point here is uh, to say that bare metal clusters are very important to us, but also OpenStack uh, support and some of this tooling could be a bit better as well, especially in the research and academic community. Not all of us have the luxury of public clouds available to us and we're often working with on-prem resources. So that's, um, that's something which uh, is important to us. And last thing here to say uh, that experimental features of Cluster API, such as a cluster class, are something that we're quite keen on. So if somebody has used that, especially in production, we'd love to hear your experiences. So for the rest of this, um, I'm going to really talk about how we approached this work and what I think worked really well for us. This is just from my personal perspective on how we went about things in the SK Regional Center project. And hopefully it's something that you can, you can draw on and will be helpful to others as well. Uh, the first thing here to mention is uh, about um, incremental changes versus incremental improvements, um, especially within the wider sort of agile mindsets. Incremental changes and small steps are what's often encouraged. But, um, worth asking, you know, incremental changes just for the sake of small steps sometimes aren't very useful. So worth asking, are those incremental changes adding value in their own right? Are they valuable in a generic sense or are they valuable to you and your use case specifically? So as an example of this, um, way before cluster API stuff in the SRC project, we did deploy a Rancho high availability cluster and we had plans to improve it bit by bit and migrate to it eventually. And that is often a wise and steady approach, but it simply wasn't required in our case. It's not like we had many people depending on this infrastructure. So we didn't need to do it um, in, in that sort of way. And it meant a lot of context switching, doing something, going back to it months later, and then everything's broken and you have to start, start over. So thinking about um, um, whether those incremental steps are adding value in their own right it was, was, was very important. And a way that helped us do that, which is um, instead of just pros and cons lists when you're approaching a different a change in direction, asking uh, more probing questions, such as the ones that I've, I've listed here, for example, was really valuable in, in, in establishing the value that we're trying to gain by doing this work and really pinpointing that. This isn't some sort of exhaustive list of questions and I claim no authorship over these questions, but it's just to highlight the kind of thinking that, that really helps. So establishing the why, why do we wanna do this now, and even why shouldn't we do this as a contrary set of thoughts is also really helpful in establishing a clear path to this work. So it also allowed me to think about Am I just wanting to do this because it's new and shiny? Do we really need this? Uh, is it because I heard about it at KubeCon and now I just want to play around with it myself? Um, but no, there were genuinely good reasons uh, to take this on. So um, I'll, 
I'll fangirl for a second and mention that um, Emily Fox mentioned in her Valencia keynote about occasionally taking a step back and asking yourselves whether you're taking the most direct path to something. And that's something that really stuck with me about taking the most direct path to something. So that's something that I've tried to apply here and think about what's the value that you're trying to gain and are you taking the most direct path to it? And that's something that's specifically reflected in question three, for example. So um, what really worked well for us, I think, was establishing the groundwork before implementing in the form of answering those questions, for example, and engaging with the people and, and really asking for help um, as and when needed. And a small story that I'll share in this respect is the fact that I, um, I really wanted to clean up our Kubernetes deployment strategy and kind of felt like it was my responsibility to do something about it as the Kubernetes enthusiast in the team. And perhaps a bit of unhealthy, I can do this by myself as well, I couldn't. Um, so it was a conversation over coffee, sitting with the team and having thought about some of those questions beforehand, sharing with them what I wanted to implement and why and how I thought it would help us and it would make our cluster management um, maintenance more manageable, improve our security posture, upskill within the team, et cetera. So partly because of that, but mainly because they're both lovely humans, it resulted in buy-in from the team and we had alignment internally with the system team as well and that was really valuable because it meant that we had support commitment from them and that made us more confident in taking this on as well. So that was, um, I'm, why I'm telling you that is because it really resulted in us doing it together, whether it was within the team or across teams and I was really relieved in the end to have, to have not been doing it alone. Um, and the last thing to say here is that um, having established and pinpointed the value that we were trying to gain at the beginning of it was really important in the implementation stage as well. So having done that, when it came time to implementation, it was fairly straightforward to land on the solution that we did, which is, yep, we'll reuse the Ansible roles, but we'll write the rest of our machinery ourselves, because that was the most direct path to achieving the value that we'd identified at the outset. So I'll... Um, conclude this bit with a few personal takeaways if they're hopefully helpful to, to other people who are starting on their cloud native journeys as well. A uh, big plus one for when technical people acknowledge and lean into the social challenges involved. Uh, something that I think about in this regard is how does one reward people um, for such wonderful behavior? If you have thoughts on that, I'd love to hear it. Um, the cloud native landscape being varied and rich does make it big and overwhelming sometimes and that's you know, important to acknowledge that as well. Um, the silver lining I find here is that there is no one right way, there's no one magical golden solution. So focusing on a solution that works for you and choosing to make progress towards that as opposed to waiting for a perfect answer um, is, often, um, uh, is often helpful. And remembering to engage with, with the people, whether the people today might mean the community here or software architects in your organization or your fellow teammates, um, asking for help. Asking for help doesn't always come easy uh, either. It takes practice, so uh, reach out to people. Um, that's always, um, always beneficial. Um, and the last point here is something that is Reflect, was reflected in the way that we approach things in the SRC project, but um, was that sticking to the simple and straightforward path um, helps to get to a more sustainable solution. And that's really something that is derived from the observatory's perspective, the more wider perspective towards cloud native tools as well. Um, we're almost wanting to keep things, um, we don't necessarily always need the new flashy things, we want to almost keep it as boring and vanilla as possible because we believe that will lead us to a more predictable, stable, reliable uh, system and solution because we're a 50 year project, so we're hoping that by making better decisions up front, we're able to build something that lasts and that we're able to adapt when it needs to look different because it will need to look different in time. So. By sticking to, uh, by resisting the urge rather to, to build something special and custom uh, to us specifically is something that's gonna be really valuable for us and ultimately result to cost saving. Um, our cloud native journey started about five years ago and we've been seeing continual improvement in the tools that we're using. So that's made us increasingly comfortable in relying on them and that's, that's been really wonderful. So congratulations on making it to the end. <laughs> um, I'm going to leave some open questions here. I'm not going to go through these specifically, but these are the kinds of things that, that, are, that are on our minds at the minute and that we're thinking about. So if you'd like to talk to us about any of these or some of these tools that we're interested in, please, please do. Um, and if that sounded interesting, please do follow the project. 
Uh, we're only just getting started. Uh, construction's ongoing. It's a very exciting time for the project. Um, we have, uh, there's a recruitment portal up there. We're about to advertise for a software quality engineer, so keep your eyes on that. Um, check out Uger's talk from Monday, and Uger and I are both here. We have tidbits of swag as well. Please come talk to us. We're very friendly. Um, and that's a beautiful image of the Galactic Center uh, as taken by Pablo from our SK Low site. And uh, last thing to say here is thank you, some shout outs to the people who made this possible. This talk was a team effort. Um, so big thank you to, to Uger, but to Piers and, and Marco and James and Rob as well. And uh, Donnie for the clicker, thank you. <laughs> um, and with that, I'll invite you to leave feedback for the session. I'd really appreciate it. And thank you for your attention. And I'll take questions. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, so uh, I didn't get a quite clear picture about, uh, were you trying to actually uh, do K8s to replace your uh, current like OpenStack uh, infrastructure uh, for your particular project? No, so we, we're still deploying it on, um, on the OpenStack infrastructure, but we're just using Cluster API to talk to the OpenStack control plane to bring up the VMs and do all of that in a, in a much more cleaner way. So using like uh, Magnum or something like that, right? Um, you get, you no, uh, there's no magnum in between either. So uh, cluster APIs, um, uh, OpenStack uh, controller, OpenStack component, or CAPO, um, is, allows us to, deploying that in our management uh, plane for cluster API allows us to interface with OpenStack uh, directly to build the VMs, to build load balancers, and uh, do that kind of, build that kind of OpenStack infrastructure. There's an interesting project and update on magnum that you might want to look at is from Vexhost. Uh, they have an update with actually they use Capo and Capi uh, through Magnum to actually create Kubernetes clusters in OpenStack. Oh, nice. Um, but the, the other thing I had a question about was um, um, in regards to network acceleration, obviously you need a lot of bandwidth. Um, you're using uh, Calico, I guess, for your CNI. And uh, I was just asking if you were like, trying to use any network accelerations like uh, DBDK or SRLV for, uh, to kind of accelerate those things on the under, underlay. Uh, do you mean when we actually move the data to the network of regional centers and what kind of storage we'll use there? Well, from uh, the open size perspective, right? So ah. underneath Neutron, you guys are probably using OVS or some other uh, networking. Like yeah, that. so we were um, largely using cinder volumes uh, before. Uh, we've got our own um, Ceph cluster within that OpenStack project, and then we use Rook to provision uh, persistent volumes via via Rook on that, on that Ceph infrastructure. That's not a very efficient uh, way of doing it. Uh, we're looking at Manila as well within, uh, within OpenStack, possibly as well, and then perhaps Longhorn too, which is I was on the end. So uh, on the underlying networking that you guys are using for that, is that uh, Neutron with OVS or OVN? Yeah, yeah, we, sorry, sorry for bumping in. So yes, we use Neutron, and the main production clusters uh, will be on bare metal, so uh, with some parts of OpenStack, so that we can still do the provision and still use, still use cluster API. And uh, based on OpenStack, we'll continue with uh, Ceph on OpenStack, uh, so uh, that's the current architecture we have. It, uh, currently, it's, it doesn't satisfy our, the data rate that we showed, so we are, uh, that's why I think the long home was there and some other alternatives at the bare metal level. Uh, we are looking for uh, different uh, storage solutions, uh, but at this moment, the uh, resiliency and distributed storage so that we can actually allow people uh, with, with, uh, without us not worrying about uh, uh, Supporting 25 teams across the world is more important. So, uh, and uh, is the is the tools that uh, technologies that we currently know. So we are just sticking it uh, sticking it with uh, sticking it with it uh, a little bit. Okay. Uh, the other question I have is about. Since, oh, go ahead. I have lots more questions. By the way. No, I have a lot of questions. Go ahead. Um, hi. Uh, great talk. Uh, so I noticed that you mentioned that you guys are using Rook, but uh, you're exploring Longhorn. Uh, so I'm, I was wondering what are the 
what drove you to uh, sort of look at other solutions? Because we're sort of in the same boat. I think so. Um, Within the, I'll say for the SK Regional Center project, you can, you can say for the, for the tech ops, but I think um, the way the infrastructure is currently set up, setting up a Ceph cluster on our open stack resources effectively is doing Ceph on Ceph, and that's not very efficient. So we're looking to maybe use Longhorn as an efficient way to use the memory that is available on some of our nodes, because some of the nodes do need to be high memory nodes anyway. Yeah, thanks. Was there anything more you wanted to add, Uger? No? Go ahead, if you have another question. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm sorry. Um, uh, so uh, you guys are moving to bare metal uh, for your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, were you looking at the Metal 3 project for that, uh, to deploy them? I don't think we've looked at Metal 3, have we? Yeah. You have? Can, sorry, can you repeat again? Um, so there's a project called Metal 3 that's, uh, that uh, utilizes Ironic uh, to deploy bare metal hosts for uh, yes, Kubernetes yes, clusters. We, yeah, we did look. Yeah, we did look at it, uh, I think, eight months ago. So uh, I, I'm, I wasn't the one that looked at it, so I don't know the details. But uh, I think there was an issue so that we couldn't uh, use it due to some technicalities. There was an open bug somewhere. Uh, I, I don't know the story behind it, but uh, I'm happy to, to take it offline and discuss it a little bit further so that I can check the actual messages from history. But yeah, uh, we did uh, investigate that as well uh, when we were switching to cluster API uh, because, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? I'll ask one. No? Um, yeah, go you guys ahead. are dealing with such remote locations and long distances for, for both, I guess, providing power and transmitting data. How are you addressing those problems? That's a great question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, the, the, the biggest thing to say is that it is, it is a very big project. So, like, the engineering side of things is something that um, I'll be honest, I, I don't have uh, as much um, up-to-date knowledge on as, as I should, but yes, power especially is, is an issue that, that we have to actively deal with, especially when we're working with remote, uh, remote locations. Um, and yeah, thankfully we have a fantastic engineering team uh, working on that <laughs> so that we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> hey, Ryan. Hey, yeah, this is uh, very exciting work. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you've looked into anything for uh, cluster federation or uh, multi-cluster job scheduling to run the, the jobs across all the SRC sites. That is a great question. Um, yes, I think this was one of the one of the questions on my um, on my open questions as well, which is whether we can use some sort of service mesh solution to help us federate a network of regional centers. Um, it's something that we actually had a sort of prototype feature to try out in this last um, program increment uh, with Linkerd and. Um, Yes, I'm very excited to possibly use something like that. Um, it is something that, again, would allow us to allow different regional centers to deploy Kubernetes however it is they, they want and still give us that um, uh, layer four, layer seven control and, and be able to orchestrate jobs and stuff like that. So yes, um, I'm very interested in that. Uh, but yeah, happy to have more of a technical conversation around how that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if anyone here is from Linkerd, but they announced that in 2.15, early next year, they're, um, they're, they should be shipping at least flat cross-cluster networks, so that might be something to look at there. Fantastic. I, I didn't have a question. I just, yeah, no, I that's great. You Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> On one of the slides, you said that you're moving a petabyte of data across the network. In time is the answer to that, in time. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we're working with uh, the, the wider group of NRENs that we have access to, which is the academic networks um, that do uh, high bandwidth uh, network transfers and, and working with uh, um, DTNs and, and providers in that, in that space as well. So it is something that um, we don't have a clear answer on at the moment but it's also something that, like I said, it is a staged rollout, so we're not gonna flick the switch on and have a petabyte of data a day coming on one day, so that's What kind of hopefully. bandwidth can you transfer now? Like what, generally? <laughs> We've been running yeah. a program for the last five years called the Data Mover Challenge, which is basically looking at new and experimental tools to saturate 100 gig networks. Um, currently, we're pushing about 89.9 um, gigabits per second over a 100 gig network. 
Um, we're expecting those flows to continue. There are multiple hundred gig paths out of Perth uh, running up to Singapore uh, and also multiple hundred gig paths on the east coast of Australia as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, for, for Africa, we, we are actually expert. So the design is not uh, set in stone for Africa as well, because at the time we had the same design for both sides, so that we uh, process the data in a sensor region, then ship it over the on the gig network, but we are now thinking maybe we can do more, uh, uh, so we, we can move the processing a little bit next to the sites a little bit more, just to handle uh, different requirements for different continents, so yeah. Great. 